that's the goal line, right? To, to be able to process that without the system shutting down, because, you know, how often have we heard about airlines shutting down because their systems fail and all the planes get canceled and you got thousands of customers sitting at the airport. Well, you can't have your customers sitting, you know, around waiting for you for you to reboot your register or reboot your, you know, your system. And so we need to understand what kind of volume are they testing against or expecting. Growing a business requires a holistic approach that extends beyond sales and marketing. This approach needs alignment among people, processes, and technologies. So if you're a business owner, operations, or finance leader looking to learn growth strategies from your peers and competitors, you're tuned into the right podcast. Welcome to the WBS Podcast, where scalable growth using business systems is our number one priority. Now... Here is your host, Sam Gupta. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of the WBS Podcast. I'm Sam Gupta, your host and principal consultant at independent ERP and digital transformation consulting firm, Elevate IQ. Do you know a headless platform that has received millions of dollars in funding in the last two years? Do you know a headless platform That is equally strong with B2B and B2C, but primarily targeted at retail-centric brands. Do you know a headless platform that has logos such as GNC, McDonald's, Bodybuilding.com, but it's not Commerce Tools, Striker, or Elastic Path? So which one is it? If you have guessed Fabric, then you are right. In today's episode, we invited a panel of cross-functional experts for a live interview on LinkedIn, who brings significant expertise to discuss Fabric's capabilities. We discussed its unique value proposition, its deep capabilities for T2C and B2B companies, and its journey of multiple rounds of funding within a few months. Finally, we discussed the background of their executives and how that might influence their corporate and go-to-market strategy. With that, let's get to the conversation. Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's show. And if you're joining for the first time, this is part of our e-commerce series for which we meet every Wednesday at 5.30 p.m. Eastern. We review one vendor or the solution independently. And for today, we are going to be talking about a headless platform called Fabric. And uh, these guys are one of the coolest out there, similar to commerce tools. So we are going to have a lot of fun discussing that. Before we do that, we are going to start with everybody's intros. I am going to start with my intro. If you don't know me, I am Sam Gupta, principal at Elevate IQ. Elevate IQ is the ERP commerce digital transformation considering firm. On that note, I am going to move to Robert for his intro. Hi, Robert Brown. I'm principal of Robert Brown e-commerce consulting, um, and I'm really looking forward to today's show. Okay, amazing. Thank you so much for being here, Robert. And uh, if you're in the audience joining for the first time, make sure you guys post your questions and comments. Typically, we try to cover them towards the tail end of the show. If you're in out of time, we'll make sure that you are going to receive your answers. On that note, I am going to start with the quick briefing, Robert, and then you can probably offer your commentary based on whatever research um you may have done uh, on this platform or the experiences or the stories you might have. Um, So Fabric, uh, as I had mentioned, they are part of the Headless Gang. uh, And obviously, they are also one of the coolest. They probably are receiving the similar attention as commerce tools. Uh, Not sure if they have the same attention from the consulting firms. Uh, for example, I think Deloitte is very well invested in, in commerce tools, but I don't quite understand the market share of these large consulting firms as well. So I don't know, Robert, if you have any sort of insight there, if Deloitte is going to be more in the automotive sector, because my perception when I, I look at commerce tools, they are doing really, really well in the automotive sector when they are going to have large logos. Um, such as your Porsche, Audi, a uh, bunch of them, right? These guys have a lot of logos in fashion, which is, you know, very exciting for me because in fashion, retail, apparel, grocery, when you look at the B2B retail, these are the patches which are going to have the real omni-channel, omni-channel experience 
uh, in general that's where customer experience matters i am super excited about the apparel and retail because the kind of inventory that they have you know they have always been very different animal from the erp perspective also from the e-commerce perspective and i don't know if any other platforms are going to have similar uh, capabilities as fabric uh, you know if you look at their apis it, they don't look very different to be honest uh, but the differences are going to be in the way the data model is designed so one of the things that i have noticed in the case of fabric uh, robert is going to be and i don't know if you are familiar with the organization called arts and arts uh, i think we are going to probably review their the full name uh, during our presentation but they are the organization that sort of define the data model for the retail organization they are i believe they are the not for profit organization and you know when they you look at the data model for retail organization it's one of the complex they are i believe sponsored funded by a lot of different pos companies uh, because they try to utilize their data model so these guys are trying to set the standards for the retail data model and all the retail gurus uh really talk about uh you know how arts is powerful and this is the first time i have seen the references of arts uh basically inside e-commerce and fabric has replicated their data model based on that uh we have seen flavors of this in the i believe in salesforce commerce i'm pretty sure uh you know commerce tools probably is going to have the similar flavors as well but nobody has been sort of explicit that okay i am building capabilities based on this data model because that's already proven in the enterprise retail platforms in these industries but they have these guys have been very explicit overall from the market positioning perspective this is a very enterprise platform uh, just like your commerce tools acl commerce uh, striker elastic path uh, acl commerce is probably these guys are probably going to call them slightly legacy but obviously they have developed their Uh, headless capabilities as well now if you're going to compare fabric at this point of time you are not going to find any demos whatsoever okay of this platform on youtube and the reason for that is the way they these guys are trying to position themselves uh, is going to be this is a pure play headless as a service platform meaning it's really targeted for developers uh, and they are trying to create these scalable apis and the composable commerce experience there are many different concepts uh that are sort of ingrained uh in the whole headless uh concept but these guys are pure play api they don't have any sort of ad they partner with many other platforms in the market uh, i believe ampliance they utilize them as cms and then uh, uh algolia i believe they are the search platform so search is they algolia probably partners with pretty much everybody in the headless community so i will pause there robert i don't know if you're going to have any sort of commentary yeah so they are really pushing the dtc uh they their management team and their connections um and their funding are really helping them grab some really key note um players so they've got chicos gnc crate yeah. barrel and restoration hardware that that's a slam dunk I know. I know um now if you think about those brands that means it's going to cost you a lot of money yeah um and you're going to get what you pay for so it's starting out at about 6 grand a month and you're going to add on to that very easily um so th- this is not for middle tier players in and then I, i can almost guarantee that i think they have referred this in their documentation that they are talking about the companies that have outgrown shopify plus those are the customers that they are targeting in fact one of the executives uh, you know comes from shopify plus yep. and the reason why they have hired him is because obviously they want to go after uh, those customers <laughs> yep uh, you know now i am going to have need a quick clarification based on your comment so you mentioned Six grand a month, and I don't know where that figure is coming from. Do you want to provide some more colors there in terms of, uh, you know, what are the variables in the six grand per month? Who's paying that, it? That is just for the tool itself, based on Captera, um, and then it's going to be for all the plugins and and toys that you want to add on top of there are going to be additional cost. Okay, so, so it, it's it's going to be just the tool fabric. Um, it doesn't talk about 
and they don't publish this, they don't talk about, you know, is there an additional cost for processing? Is there transactional costs? Is there, um, you know, how much each one of the plugins is going to be? But, you know, you start to consider this when you're at that level, Chico's GNC, Crate and Barrel Restoration Hardware, that that's inconsequential. Exactly. Those are pennies, I guess, you know. Exactly. <laughs> and, and so really, well, you know, the only reason I mentioned that is to just put it out there up front for the, the middle tier players that are thinking, ooh, it looks really nice. I want to jump up there. You're not there yet. Exactly. It's, and you know, one of the things that my my um, mother and father used to tell me when I was a little kid, if you have to ask the price, then you can't afford it. Exactly. Exactly. Could not agree more. But one of the things that I am going to add here is going to be, so if you look at the price point of, uh, you know, six grand per month, that's probably going to be $72,000 per year, if my math is right here. Now, if you're looking for enterprise grade, workload and you are hitting these apis and you are probably going to have millions and millions of transactions uh you know so i don't know how these guys will be able to afford the infrastructure in that kind of money so i think that is only for the platform i think there are going to be additional charges i would doubt if it is going to cost you know 70 grand per month for that kind of those kind of workloads so Another site specifically reaffirms the 6000 a month, but unlike Shopify Plus, you get to choose the services you want, so you don't need to pay for an entire platform. So you, it's, it's you know, the, the menu options yeah. that you pay for. Yeah, very interesting. Okay, any other colors commentary before we start on the slides, uh, Robert? No. Okay, great additions there. So let's uh, look at... Um, some of their uh, recent uh, press releases and based on that obviously they have done uh, a lot of work there overall from the funding perspective and i have not seen such aggressive funding uh, with any other company so far they literally have raised uh, two or three rounds within a year which is nearly impossible for most brands so obviously investors are seeing something here uh, with this whole headless moment. And by the way, this is happening at the same time and every single tech company out there is losing a market momentum. Uh, you talk about one of the hottest, whether you talk about um, Salesforce, uh, whether you talk about Facebook, Google, everybody sort of losing um, some sort of market share there and investors are investing in this one, you know, and if I look at the acquisition potential of these platforms, obviously one of the larger tech powerhouses are probably going to be acquiring these guys unless they become something like Salesforce or Shopify, which is a rare possibility, uh, you know, uh, to get there. Uh, that may be possible, uh, but I think what investors are trying to do is, especially based on the, these guys' business model, they are trying to figure out, okay, how can they create more of the marketplace business model and, uh, and create the next Amazon? In fact, if you look at the CEO's profile, he comes from Amazon. And that's why they are really excited about this particular company. He built Amazon Basic. Um, so now Amazon is trying to compete with their own sellers uh, at this point of time. And that's probably going to be even more. So obviously, they are going to be threatened. And if you look at the market share, the brand share of some of the retailers or the distributors that are selling through Amazon as a channel, uh, they are obviously going to be a little afraid with Amazon uh, overall on that channel. So, so uh, they are going to find the other ways of getting revenue. And the marketplaces, we have several different variety of marketplaces in the market, but one of the flavor is probably going to be platform-driven marketplace. If you look at Fabric, these guys are also trying to build the marketplace. They are platform, they are also marketplace. In fact, if you look at Shopify's business model, the reason why Shopify is so big and big commerce is not as big because they had figured out the payment play long before anybody else could. <laughs> so either you have to be platform centric from the uh, payment perspective or you have to be from the marketplace perspective. And these guys, Fabric, they are launching their own marketplace similar to Amazon. So this is going to be really powerful 
if companies are not going to buy the platform, then they will try to grab either the ad market share or the commerce market share big time because they already have the infrastructure. The only thing they have to do is they really have to invite uh, the sellers, and that's going to be a competition for Google, Amazon, uh, from the ad revenue perspective. So that's a very interesting play, and that could be the reason why investors are so excited in the down economy right now uh, on these platforms. Absolutely. I mean, if you look at some of the uh, the names that they already are using the marketplace, like uh, P in the Pod, the Tot, and Motherhood Maternity, those those are big names. Yes. And understanding that they've set up the marketplace for them, that saves them a lot of time and money. It allows you, you know, it's pre-built and it allows you to get a market a heck of a lot faster. So, Robert, there are two layers to it, okay? So the way Spriker is trying to position themselves, okay, they are trying to tell these brands that you need to have your own marketplace. You already have, let's say, 150,000 sellers. You should be opening up marketplace just like Amazon. That's one play. That is going to be a platform play. Versus yep. the platform itself is going to act as the marketplace. The way Amazon works. Amazon is a technology company, even though they are a retail company as well, but they are primarily a technology company. They have their own marketplace. And that's how these platforms are trying to position themselves. Fablet have already announced that they are launching their marketplace. So that's a very different business model. In this case, now they are competing with their own customers, uh, if you think about it. <laughs> so that's a very interesting play in general. Right. So for them to launch the marketplace, you know, it depends on how they execute on it. But it could be very interesting because one of the challenges that all of these independent shops have is when they're out of stock or they don't have the ability to cross sell stock from one member to another. Exactly. And I've talked to a couple of people that have looked at that challenge and uh, they're trying to create a way to create that web, a, a virtual marketplace, if you will. So, you know, seller A can connect with seller B and cross sell their products and they just drop ship from their individual warehouses. So if if Fabric is doing that and creating that ability to, to move that forward, that's going to be very interesting. What you just told is going to be even more complicated, confusing, as well as interesting, okay? I don't think anybody has thought that out so far. I, at least personally, I have not seen. But, you know, if somebody figures that out, that's going to be even more interesting. Because right now, the only thing they are trying to figure out is there are three different marketplaces in the market at this point of time. Either you have more of the Amazon-like marketplaces where they are the retailer, as well as they are sort of opening their own marketplaces, that would not classify as the OEM or the brand or the manufacturer launching their own marketplace for their channel partners. That trend is also there. For example, Walmart would be that example, but not everybody is trying to be Walmart. But OEMs are trying to figure out that, that business model. Spriker is pushing after that business model. They are trying to coach every single brand that you should be launching your own marketplace and you should be controlling your own revenue as opposed to going through uh, Amazon. The third scenario is going to be slightly more tech company driven marketplaces. These are essentially tech companies such as your fabric. You talk about, you know, Fictiv in the manufacturing space, Codebeam, also in the manufacturing Giga. Uh, I believe uh, they are also in the sort of the procurement marketplace. If you look at every single company that Excel has invested, okay, that has some sort of marketplace flavor or the uh, platform flavor, they are trying to create these ecosystems. But Robert, again, I'm going back to your point. You had something there in that comment, okay? I don't think anybody has figured that out so far. But if they figure that out, then that's going to be even more interesting. Yeah. So they're working on it. I, I know some people that are actually working on it, but they don't have any betas yet. So I'm I'm waiting for, to see a beta. Interesting. Very interesting. So uh, I'm very interested in hearing more who's doing that. But that that's that that's gonna kill it, man. That's all I can say right now. <laughs> okay. Okay. Amazing. So here we have some more commentary here. Uh, you know, overall from the the companies that have invested, and it was like you know they had received nine point. 5 million uh, and after that you have 43 million in series A funding within a couple of months uh, and that's again massive within the same year from 9.5 to 43 million is what they have uh, done and obviously the purpose of this funding is going to be to accelerate 
product development of a headless commerce platform. And I believe this is the only pure play headless platform that has equally strong B2B as well as B2C capabilities, commerce tools. Uh, they have announced recently that they are going to be developing B2B, but um, I'm going to be sticking with my comment. You know, I don't know how you are going to change the data model, you know, after the fact. Uh, and maybe, you know, they don't have as many installations, so it might be okay for them. But typically, it's going to be really hard if they have a lot of installations. But these guys have uh, done this uh, from the ground up. They have really thought through that they were designing it for B2B as well as B2C. Um, so their data model is going to be far more flexible overall to support all of these business models. Now, what else do we have here? So they are talking about the generalized e-commerce market, which we all understand that it's going to grow a lot. Uh, here they have a comment about their positioning. So they are saying that it was designed for D2C uh, and B2B brands. So they were always targeting D2C as well as B2B brands run by industry veterans. Want to end replatforming e-commerce. I think that's the generalized pitch that every headless uh, company has that they want to stop the replatforming. Re and they are right that every company replatform every three to five years. Uh, that's given based on the amount of changes that are happening with Google, you know, with the kind of technologies that are coming in the market. So every company has to replatform. So that's definitely a trend. But I'm not too sure if headless is really going to help because even in the headless world, you are probably going to have challenges and you probably have to replatform. So I'm not too sure about that whether they will be able to stop replatforming. But this is definitely interesting. Here, then they have some of the logos mentioned here, and we are going to be analyzing every logo to figure out, okay, where, which market they are really going after. So they have ABC Carpet here, uh, Robert, uh, you know, uh, Carpet and Home. Then they have GNC. Then they have uh, Juicy Couture. Couture. Yeah. Then uh, all of them have one flavor that is going to be, they have the retail location. And so far, the e-commerce platforms that we have seen, they all talk about e-commerce. They don't talk about that retail component, which is going to be probably 80 to 90 percent of the revenue. If you look, look for the true omni-channel experience, you have to figure out how your POS experience is going to go to your commerce experience. Otherwise, you don't have a play. You are always going to have a problem. So this is the first one that is really talking about that retail experience. And when you talk about those apparel brands, uh, you know, that's where the real complexity is in the inventory, the way they do their merchandising planning. So that's where I am interested in seeing how these guys are going to do the POS experience. If everything is going to be powered through APIs, obviously, that's where you are going to get that uh, omni-channel experience. And now the channels are going to be increasing as well. So that's where I'm really excited about this one, because these guys are really talking about POS. But if you pay attention to the, the way they have done their APIs, I personally could not see much of the POS there. They have a little, uh, you know, POS presence, but not a lot. So I don't know what these guys are doing right now. Maybe they are using another POS <laughs> because the POS is, is a different beast when you have to sort of figure out, okay, store one to store two experience. That itself is a massive, massive uh, beast right there. And obviously you have a lot of platforms uh, in the market that can do that really well, including companies like NCR. That's their bread and butter. So this is probably going to be a threat for, for them. So I don't know how that is going to play out overall in the market. But overall, this is, a, this is very, very interesting. So when we were talking about, you, you just said, none of the others that we had talked about, talked about um, retail POS. I think we did talk about that with Shopify. And it makes sense that Shopify had it and some of the executives came from Shopify. And so I think what they're trying to do is they're trying to um, and they are trying to take those customers that have outgrown Shopify Plus. So I think what they're doing is focusing on ensuring that they really can provide omni-channel. And I'm just digging in to try to see if I can find anything else on that, and I can't. So I'm actually going to build on that comment, Robert. So you are right that, you know, why I personally like Shopify is because of that TOS layer that you get as part of Shopify that is going to be pre-built, pre-integrated owned by, you know, OEM, which is a big factor for me personally. Um, now, if you look at the Shopify POS, Shopify Pause is not really designed for the heavy foot traffic retail establishments. 
That's nope. my understanding of, uh, you know. So when you go to Walmart, <laughs> the kind of, you know, pause that you need there is very different from your Shopify pause. Okay. Shopify pause is designed for, uh, you go to a mall, you are uh, buying a dress. How much traffic a cashier is going to get? Once every probably five minutes, 10 minutes, uh, you know, it's, the transactions are not going to be as busy. The 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 receipt that you are going to get uh, is not going to be as complex. It's very easy, two items, three items. So so that's where the real differentiator is in my mind. When I look at, you know, the, the real pause, uh, the NCR, IBM kind of pauses versus your, your Shopify pass. Um, so I don't know if these guys are trying to replace those NCR ones <laughs> or just the Shopify play. So that's, uh, again, very interesting overall. Yeah, we, we had talked about this last year going into the holidays and holiday shopping transaction volume can sh- has shut down systems. Exactly. And, <laughs> and, you know, so when we are talking about that, hol- that, that, is, that is the... That, that's the goal line, right? To, to be able to process that without the system shutting down because, you know, how often have we heard about airlines shutting down because their systems fail, right? And all the planes get canceled and you got thousands of customers sitting at the airport. Well, you can't have your customers sitting, you know, around waiting for you for you to reboot your register or reboot your, your you know, your system. And so we need to understand, you know, what kind of volume are they testing against or expecting and I think with the Shopify, you're absolutely right. It's it's the, like the little one-offs. It's you know they they might have two little small boutique shops that you know might get a couple of customers, and it's not going to be in the uh, Jersey Gardens Mall where they're going to get you know a lineup of customers trying to get um, the latest toy, and you know it, it's going to be uh, the GI Joe all over again, right? Exactly, exactly. And this is where my personal challenge is with headless. Although I'm completely on board with, uh, you know, the headless concept. Uh, but if you really think about it, if you have to replace those paths, because unless you replace them, you are not going to get omni-channel experience, uh, you know, unless you are doing some batch integration, the way pauses are typically integrated with your backend, that's how most retail businesses work. So unless you sort of integrate, unless you have that real-time inventory visibility across all of the channels, you are not going to get omni-channel experience. And now, if you have to build those paths, now that's a massive investment right there. Now, is everybody going to be building their own paths? That It does not make any sense because they are sort of the, the ERP system in itself. If you are going to be developing the head for each of these paths, oh my goodness, you have no idea how much investment you are looking at. So, you know, I, I think there has to be some sort of middle ground there that, okay, I am looking for headless, but then I am looking for some head as well that, okay, this is what I'm going to give you as a head, especially if you are trying to replace those past platforms <laughs> that you so see in here, here, Here's a great use case to talk, you know, that, that will highlight the challenge that you face. I took, you know, it was my wife and I's 25th anniversary. Yeah. And we went to Hawaii. So we were there for eight days. And she, you know, one day she decided she wanted to go shopping. Of course, I get it. So, yeah. so we're going to different stores. Some of them are brand name stores. I'm not going to call them out by name. Some of them are brand name stores. Some of them are not. Some, you know, some of them are more regional. Yeah. Um, and some of them are, are nationally well known. And so at one of the, so there were a couple of items that she was looking for, depending on the store. At one store, she wanted this particular shirt. So she said, hey, do you have this in my size? And they said, you know, everything that we have is out, but let me go check the other stores to exactly. see whether they have it. Exactly. And so she was able to go over to the register and pull yep. up the inventory from the other stores and tell yep. us which store it was. Then she called that store and said, exactly. reserve that, that item. And we were able to drive over to the other store and pick it up, go to another retailer. Exactly. And they couldn't see the inventory. They didn't know. And they said we had to figure out on our own <laughs> went to a third one yeah these are obviously different systems they were actually able to place the order and actually have it put aside for us so they didn't even have to make the call so huh. we just had to swing by there and it was already packaged for us and we could go yeah so very interesting use cases there the first one that you spoke robert that's very 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 complicated but that has always been there as part of the store experience as part of the pause experience and that's how companies like ncr they made so much money in the market because they could do that. And that's 80% of retail revenue. DTC is great. 
e-commerce is great, but that is still 20 to 30 percent revenue for most retailers. But the fast traffic is bread and butter. So when you are going to be replacing that, obviously you need to convince them a lot that that's going to work. Of course, that is the the critical success factor for them. If e-commerce works, they, that's great. <laughs> if it does not, that's okay as well because you know that's really not their bread and butter. So again, I'm you know I I like the concept. But I'm not sure how that is going to be implemented, especially with those pauses that you are going to see with the heavy uh, retail traffic when you are talking about very busy electronic store apparel um, and 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 grocery. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right. So let's look at uh, you know some more scenarios here. So here you know when you look at the APIs, obviously they are very sophisticated, very well done. Um, you know it's very comprehensive overall from the functionality perspective. But again, I'll be worried about the head. Okay, how is head going to be done? Who's going to be doing that? Uh, that would be my concern, unless you are simply trying to integrate with the existing pauses, uh, then that's a different case. But again, the architecture is going to be critical there. So here, some more uh, you know, commentary. I think I had mentioned that the CEO comes from Amazon and he had a comment here that I built Amazon Basics. Amazon Basics is coming for you, which is true as well. It's really coming for you. So obviously you are going to be fighting for your own market share. So be a little careful there when you are going to be putting all of your eggs in Amazon basket <laughs> because you have like 40 to 50% revenue right now on Amazon. So that's going to be a huge risk for you. Obviously it is in best interest of Amazon to um, to publish their own private label. And that's what everybody, every single retailer is trying to do because that's where their margins are. Some more commentary here. So this is the, another announcement, the press release that they had done right after the, the previous one. So here, I think they had hired two executives. And this is uh, Sadek and uh, Shetty, I guess, right? So here, these guys are e-commerce veterans as well. Umar's experience is in building and scaling lean commerce platforms that will help us build scalable customer-focused technology products. Um, and he has been with multiple retail and finance companies. And then uh, this one, uh, Umar, I believe, is coming from the smart shopping cart startup that uses state-of-the-art computer vision. So obviously, the reason why they have hired him is because the computer vision itself is going to be a huge play uh, in the headless space, uh, you know, slowly and gradually the APIs are going to get a lot more capabilities uh, from the computer vision perspective. And this is where I think the the, the main um, benefit is probably going to be for the merchandising department. I don't know, Robert, if you see uh, the benefits of the, the vision technology anywhere else uh, or not, uh, but here they are sort of trying to incorporate that as part of the API workflow and try to gather some intelligence from there as well. So this is going to be your sensors. Uh, obviously, you have a lot of sensors installed in the retail establishment at this point of time. That's how they sort of do their Google Analytics, uh, you know, with the technology that they have, you know, at the entrance of the door. Uh, that's how they are trying to figure out, okay, how many people are walking in to any retail store and how many people have really bought? What is their average order size? Obviously, it's far more challenging in the physical space than it is going to be with e-commerce, but they have ways of figuring that out. And that's how everybody who's going to be employed in those facilities are going to be calmed because their sales compensation are aligned with how much you have sold (laughs) and everything is counted there. Um, So that's going to be very interesting as well. So obviously, these technologies are going to play a huge role overall in creating that seamless uh, shopping experience. You know, looking at, so they break it down into, um, they have eight essential product offerings. So yeah. they've got the commerce platform, they've got the commerce apps, the APIs, the B2B commerce, the product information in the PIM system, the offers, order management, and the marketplace. And so looking at their order management, yeah, it, it looks really solid. Um Manage orders, inventory, and fulfillment all in one, as opposed to being segregated into three separate pieces. So it's all brought into one, which is nice. Um, you know, how often have you had to cobble those together and they don't talk to each other very well? So, Robert, when you compare, let's say, this with some of the other headless platforms that we have reviewed, did you find anything unique in that functionality? So in this, it's purpose-built 
to actually um, provide a number of um, flexible fulfillment options as opposed to you have to configure it and, and maybe back into it. So, you know, you can buy online, pick up in store, you can store fulfillment, D2C order fulfillment and same day delivery. Those are three, you know, those are four very different scenarios. And a lot of stores have to handle that through external process and not through the software. Exactly. And that's where I think I need to look at the architecture a little bit. Obviously, these guys are wearing the logos, uh, you know, left and right. So obviously that is working. In fact, I mean, when you look at the reviews, people are really liking it uh, so far. So obviously things are working for these guys. But uh, again, unless we have the architecture, uh, you know, we will not be able to comment whether all of those scenarios are really going to work in the real time, the way theoretically they're, they're supposed to work. <laughs> right. It's one. It's one thing for them to list it. It's another thing for them. Can they? Are they actually delivering on it? And we don't have the data, or the the you know a real live person here to tell us um, how it's going. However, shopped in some of the stores, it's it, it's working fine. Yeah, but I mean, you know, <laughs> when I look at the architecture of the brands that I had shopped in the past, if you look at the back end, you know how that works. I mean. There's a lot of ad hoc processes that are involved uh, in enabling that experience. It's not as easy. Uh, so even though things might, for example, let's say, I'll, I'll give you an example of a brand, Lululemon. If you look at their experience, I mean, see, from the outside, it's going to look at one of the, you know, best brands in the market. But if you look at their architecture and the backend systems, you know, they would be all over the place in terms of the way they are probably doing the operational transaction. So this is just one story. But if you look at the, if I look at the architecture of most retailers in the market, they just don't have that seamless experience where everything is going to be automated, at least from the inventory perspective, they are going to be counting multiple times, in multiple places, multiple systems. So somehow they are able to provide that experience. But is that a real, you know, omni-channel experience? That's going to be a question in my mind. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Do you have any other comments to add there? Okay, so here, obviously, these executives are really big in general where they are coming from. So obviously, this company is able to attract some really big names, which is what excites me about these platforms. Obviously, they have a real potential, and that's why they are able to bring all of these people to their team. And we are going to be looking at everyone's profile, and that will give us some hints about their strategy. So here, we have already seen that this is probably going to be a little bit of, uh, you know, the computer vision that they are trying to bring in. And I think that's where a lot of companies are focusing on, especially from the headless perspective. So that's going to be uh, probably the future where companies are probably going to be investing a lot of money in enabling that, that experience. Okay, so I don't have anything else on this one. Let's go to, okay. So VP of Enterprise Sales is coming from Shopify Plus. Okay, that's where they are probably going to go after the larger accounts. So once they outgrow those accounts from Shopify, uh, and that's why they have acquired the sales guy, they are probably going to have a lot of relationships there. And hopefully he can bring some of those logos to this platform. And that could be the reason why they might be winning a lot of logos right now. So here they are saying four years at Shopify Plus managing the e-commerce platforms and fry sales uh, division across North America during his tenure. Uh, he led the go-to-market and customer acquisition strategy for the growing segment. And I don't know how Shopify defines the growing segment. Maybe the brands or maybe just based on, I don't know if that is SMB or really the growth segment, but that's very interesting. Before this, he was part of Magento, so obviously has been with the e-commerce brands for a long time. So again, very interesting hire there that they are able to attract Tyler. Then we have another announcement here. So this is the... I believe after a couple of months when they had raised 43 million. So now they have done 100 million in Series B funding. And now this is led by Stripes, uh, which is very interesting. That's a payment platform, if you guys are not familiar. So if they are interested in this, then obviously there is some, some interest there. So they and all the existing investors are still part of it. Nobody has really moved out that's also a positive sign um, and they are saying closing only five months after uh, their series a of 43 million and this is actually the new round will fund our global expansion aimed at helping thousands of 
more mid-size and enterprise B2B as well as B2C brands deliver ex exceptional e-commerce experience. Some more data here, overall year-over-year -year growth has been 800%. Uh, now, I don't know what is the... Go ahead, Robert. I'm wondering how much of this is due to the pandemic um, growth. And, you know, because if you think about it, all right, so the pandemic hits, e-commerce skyrockets. And so desire to invest in e-commerce platforms skyrockets. And so I'm wondering if they, not that it's not a great platform, I'm just wondering if the, the investment dollars were looking for e-commerce players and decided, hey, this looks like a good one. Let's, you know, that's why they piled it on very quickly. So here's my take on that, Robert. That's a very interesting comment, first of all. So kudos to you in bringing that. Uh, but when you look at the kind of logos that these guys are trying to bring, I don't think these guys are going to be at the stage where they are going to be excited about e-commerce opportunity. Okay, they are slightly more mature player. Obviously, these guys have far deeper technology maturity. They understand how technology investments work. In fact, they are going to have defined budget in terms of what they are going to do overall from the R&D perspective. So that could be true, but I'm not sure how to true that as for the kind of brands that these guys are well, trying to target. If, if you think about it, they started in 2017 and their Series A came around in 2020. Right. But if you look at the overall state of tech at this point of time, these companies are still gaining the traction, but other yeah. tech companies are not gaining the traction. So, yes, the e-commerce boom was there during COVID. Now that is gone. Everybody sort of, you know, settled that, OK, it was a big deal. It's not a big deal anymore. In fact, tech was hammered the most in 2022. But these companies have not been hammered. Right, right, and and th th and that's why I'm saying this is not to take away from them as a platform. This is this is to say that they been. I think they benefited from the timing perspective because they didn't have a Series A before COVID, right? So they were formed in 2017, and suddenly it looks like and I, my timing could be a little bit off, but it looks like COVID hits, they get their Series A, and then it it piles on. Now I I would say that it's their leadership and their strategy that allowed them to take that funding and leverage it to its max so that they are continuing to grow and get the brands behind them so they are not being feeling the ill effects that everybody else is with, with the decline in e-commerce and going back to brick and mortar. Yeah, but uh, Robert, one thing I will tell you, typically I'm extremely conservative uh, when I make any sort of prediction, but I can almost guarantee you can take my words for this, okay? Uh, that these companies and the headless concept is not going anywhere. The kind of investors that these companies have, the, um, the number of logos that they are acquiring on a daily basis, I see it on a daily basis. And, and every uh, enterprise company is sort of trying to figure out how to take advantage of this. So I don't think from the concept perspective, it's going anywhere, to be honest. Uh, okay, it's not going to be just one time boom because of COVID or whatever. This is going to stay. No, no, I, I agree it's going to stick. And I'm, I'm not arguing that point with you. All I'm saying is I think what gave them a boost is, you know, got, got them that big boot burst of, of money at that, at that particular point yep. in time. I think it was the, oh, man, we need to invest in e-commerce. And they just happened to be one of the players. But because they had the right players and the right strategy, they were able to take advantage of that and probably get bigger allocations of funds than they would have had normally. Yeah, yeah, fair point, fair point. Um, so let's look at some of the, uh, you know, more points here that are outlined. Um, so we have already looked at growth and the executives. Do we have anything else? The no. other thing I could uh, catch here, Robert, which you may want to pay attention a little bit, overall, the loyalty and subscription. I don't think we have seen loyalty anywhere else. And loyalty is a very different concept as well, because typically loyalty resides, if you look at the, the GTC experience, loyalty typically resided in your OMS layer. These guys used to call OMS layer, but what is really OMS, to be honest? It's really that integrated POS experience. That's what was OMS. If you look at platforms such as, uh, which one is this? Um, I'm looking at teamwork in the apparel space. They are really big. If you go to grocery, they are going to have many different platforms, and they are going to call this as OMS. And the only reason OMS existed, and the only reason why OMS 
did not go to your ERP is because you were looking for that integrated US experience. It's it's extremely difficult for any ERP platform out there to be able to enable that experience for e-commerce players as well. It was extremely hard. That's why they existed in the architecture. So now these guys are actually trying to build the loyalty. Now, this is very interesting overall. You know, so uh, it seems like these are the only ones who have really figured out that that omni-channel architecture, uh, especially from the pause experience perspective. Yeah, most almost everybody else has either built it themselves. Yeah. Or purchased a couple of services and bolted them on. Exactly. So for, for this to be built in-house um, from the ground up with their existing architecture, I think is unique. Exactly. And we are going to say some more scenarios here overall in terms of doing something like Amazon Prime. These guys actually have capabilities to offer that. So they have different tiers, uh, your membership club, the way you are going to be collecting coins. So they have built all of that. And I don't think any other platform really uh, has done that. So overall, from the data model perspective, these guys are really strong uh, in, in, in general for the retail companies. Some more comments here. So now we have one more executive and she is uh, the marketing executive and uh, she is coming from... Okay, so she was actually working with uh, Fabric before and she just got hired. So obviously she must have done a really good job there. Um, and uh, before that... Uh, she was doing a little bit of higher education, I guess, I believe, and Adobe as well. Um, so that's very interesting. Cool. Um, Who are we talking about? Uh, so I am talking about Brewer, right? <laughs> Karen? Okay. okay. So uh, are you with me now? Yep, I'm with you. Sorry, I was on the wrong page. Okay. Okay. So here we have what else? Uh, so for Karen uh generating so they have some more comments here overall in terms of dropship and in my mind dropship is a very interesting scenario i think that is going to receive a lot of innovation overall uh, in the capabilities of endless isle i don't think companies are there overall in terms of the integration and the way they sort of recruit the vendors so uh you know that's where i, I think she's coming from so that's what uh, it's sort of interesting for me that they are going to be utilizing her experience and enabling that. So here they are saying fabric, mar fabric marketplace allows merchants of all sizes to rapidly connect with any vendor, launch, operate, and scale curated marketplace programs. So now how do you read this, uh, Robert? So are they trying to launch their own marketplace? Or are they still the platform play and they are simply trying to offer the platform to these guys? I read this as they're just trying to offer the platform to these guys. It's kind of like when Xcart um, was one of the first players to offer multi-store. If that is the case, then this would be similar offering as Spryker. My understanding, the way I read it, and I don't know if it is because of this comment or somewhere else, my understanding was that they are also trying to recruit uh, the vendors and trying to build their own marketplace. Some uh, companies are trying to do that, which is what uh, you know excited me. But if it is just this, then Spryker is also doing that. The so, difference between this and Striker is this really unlike Striker. Striker, Striker seems to be really B two B, and right. and Fabric from everything that we read and every brand that we see really looks like D two C. They have very deep B2B capabilities as well. So I'm actually going to read some more comments and then we can review if this is still, uh, you still have the same understanding what you had. So here they are saying items ship directly from fabric marketplace vendors to customers. Okay. And this would be similar to ship Bob, the way your 3PL marketplaces are going to be. In fact, Shopify is trying to get into the same game where they are trying to be sort of the fulfillment arm. So they are not just the platform play anymore. They are trying to be 3PL for their own customers. So that's a very different play. Now here they are saying, and by the way, they have branded it as Fabric Marketplace. When you are selling just the platform, you would rather call Walmart Marketplace, uh, you know, GNC Marketplace, whatever. Here they are branding it as Fabric Marketplace. Fabric Marketplace joins a scalable, composable, uh, you know, product lineup that includes headless API for items, price, inventory, cart, 
orders, shipping and promotions. Merchants can now uh, compete with the largest and most innovative pure play retailers, retailers and marketplaces online. Um, so this is, again, I think this is the same pitch as Shopify. Shopify was, uh, you know, trying to do the same that, okay, Amazon is trying to compete with you. I'll offer you the same capabilities and then you can compete with Amazon. So fabric marketplace instantly becomes one of the most impactful components of any merchant's profitability. So I'm divided, Robert. I'm not too sure. <laughs> so the, rereading this again, what it looks like they've done is they've integrated, they have in fact created their own marketplace. It looks like um, based on these comments, Fabric Marketplace allows merchants of all sizes to rapidly connect with any vendor, launch, operate, and scale curated marketplace programs. So it's like you log into the Fabric Marketplace, you have a list of vendors, you find the products from each of those vendors, you put them on your site, and when an order comes through, it goes through your site to the Fabric Marketplace to the vendor and gets drop shipped from the vendor to the customer. That's very, I, I don't know what's going on there, to be honest. <laughs> I'm confused. Um, well, it's, it's, it, it seems really quite simple, right? So you don't have inventory, but through the marketplace, you have a connection to the vendor. Okay. So you are talking about sort of, okay, you have the list of guys who can drop ship and then you are sort of, you know, recruiting right on the platform. Okay. I mean, I mean it doesn't sure. seem... I mean, not having used it, but it's almost kind of like Overlow, right? So you, you can go through Overlow and find drop shippers, and then you can add them to your site and you can make, you know, and, and then it, in most of those cases, you have, you can't uh, send an automated order to the vendor. You have to manually send it to them so it gets sent to the customer. This seems to automate the entire process. Okay, so let's say if I'm the merchant, then for me, the value add is going to be, uh, you know, number one, I am using Fabric, uh, you know, platform to enable my own marketplace. So obviously, I have to have the customer. It's not Fabric who's finding customer for me. Correct. Okay? And <laughs> otherwise, they'll probably do business with them. Correct. Um, <laughs> right? So, okay, right. so I own the customer. And now, right. you know, I don't have a product, I guess, right? Uh, right. As the brand, and then I need to shop around. Okay, who can fulfill? So I am shopping for these dropship guys, and they are going to be available right there. That okay, I found a customer. Now I simply need to find vendor and probably make my commission. That's Very. It. <laughs> Pretty much that's it. Yep. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a um, it's kind of like white labeling eBay. Yeah, it's very interesting. And again, I'm 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 divided overall. My understanding was that they were trying to create sort of the their own marketplace, the way Fictive is. Uh, you know, Fictive is pure play. Market. It's almost like competitor to Amazon at this point of time. So that was my understanding, and that's why I would think that that's the reason why investors are so excited because they all are trying to grab grab market share from Amazon, Google, and that's where you are going to get billion dollar valuation. Otherwise, you know, why would they be so excited about this? Uh, yeah, Google just hired somebody to do something different with with their Google Shopping because they want to go after Amazon. Exactly, exactly. that's what everybody is trying to do. Amazon yeah. is where the money is. They are all trying to go after Amazon. <laughs> yeah, you know, and unfortunately, you know, Google has most of the search traffic for everything but shopping. Exactly, and that's problem for Google. And Google's ad revenue, especially during this time, is coming down, and that's why they are so nervous right now. And they yeah. are trying to figure out, okay, what do we do now? Well, what happens now is is in Google, because you have reduced traffic, you have increased bidding for that reduced traffic. So um, CPC prices are going up significantly, especially you know depending on the sector. So for ads that I used to run, I could bid five, ten, fifteen cents, and you know I could I could get them all day. Now it's a dollar or more. Exactly. But overall, I think Google is going to lose in that because companies are not going to be investing as much in, in marketing because they don't have ROI. They are already struggling for cash. So obviously, because of the macroeconomic factor, they don't have as much cash to spare. That's number one. And now the marketing price is also increasing. So, you know, uh, who's going to lose? Google. <laughs> well, no, Google. Google is actually fighting back. And so now Google in their new ad platform, um, they actually give you multivariant testing across all their properties as opposed to A-B testing. So now you don't have to have Adobe Test and Target. They do it for you. So you can upload up to 20 images, provide five titles, five descriptions, five 
um, benefits, um, a, a whole bunch of stuff. And they will run it across all their platforms and come up with all the variations and say, all right, here's the winning ones. And they just continue to run them. So you can, you know, in increase your competition and then you can continue to change those and continue to iterate. So you're not, you can do it much, much faster than you can do it with AB testing. So I think that is a big strike uh, against Amazon. Advertisers really like that because you can, what are the platforms that are Google? Yeah, but Robert, overall, if you look at the the ad revenue at this point of time, uh, you know, of Google, uh, they are definitely struggling in this market condition. I'm not saying overall. Yeah. In yeah. this market yeah. condition, they are struggling and they have a real pressure right now. Uh, and they are trying to figure out, okay, how to compete with TikTok as well as some of the other brands. So coming yeah. back to the topic, uh, so oh, do you have any sort of final commentary related to this? I, you know, I wish we could give users a, a deeper um, analysis of the tool. What we have read makes it look really good, but proof is in the pudding. Yeah, so we are probably going to have uh, the second round of this one. And the reason with platforms such as this is going to be that you don't have something that you can demonstrate. In fact, you are probably not going to find any demo on YouTube. When I look at the documentation, it's very developer focused. Uh, I think that will require a little bit of training overall. Uh, even for developers, the documentation is not as comprehensive, um, you know, as I personally like to see uh, of the tools. Obviously, their APIs are great. Uh, but then how do you sort of understand the data model? How do you understand the API? Yes, they have given the documentation, but let's say if somebody is starting fresh and looking at these APIs and trying to build the ad, they will definitely require a lot of training. So I can see that as a significant investment. Uh, if you're trying to uh, build your own commerce platform now, if you have done e-commerce for the last 40 years, if you're a large enterprise, you already have your COEs you know, built up for your internal development. For them, it's probably not going to be as much of a problem. But for the other, uh, you know, companies, if you are going to be in the mid market, it's definitely going to be a challenge. It is. It is. And I think only time is going to tell where where they're going to end up being. You know, one of the things that I I liked about last week's um, vendor is they actually gave you clear uh, roadmaps. This yep. this is what we're this is what we're coming up with next. This is what's going to be a little further out, and this is what further out after that. And you know, many other vendors do not give you that clarity in, in what their roadmaps are. Maybe it's a strategic thing because they don't want their, you know, to get into the fight with, with their competition, you know, publicly launching that. You can get uh, a free demo of this. You can get a free trial. But, you know, getting a free trial of a headless, it's, it's really not what you're looking for. So, uh, Robert, the only thing I'm going to add there, when you are going to, comparing, uh, going to be comparing this with Oro Commerce, I don't know what is their valuation. I can almost guarantee this at this point of time. Okay, they are not going to have billion dollar valuation. They are probably nope. going to be somewhere in millions. Okay, so nobody, yeah. uh, people might care for Oro, but th those are going to be really small investors. So the kind of attention that Fabric, and by the way, these guys are part of the retail hundred uh, from CB Insights, and those are one of the hardest tech. Uh, in the retail space. So obviously these guys are really big. So again, you know, I don't think it's a fair comparison between this uh, and, and Oro. Those are two different. Oh, no, no. no it, it wasn't intended to be a comparison. It was just, you know, it would be really nice if people were a little bit more public about the roadmap. Exactly. I could not agree more. Any other final commentary, Robert? No? No. Nope. All right, guys. So that's it for today. If you joined for the first time, this was part of our e-commerce series for which we meet every Wednesday at 5.30 p.m. Eastern. We review one vendor or the solution. So make sure you guys are going to be here next week. We are going to come back with another uh, vendor or the solution on that note. Thanks everyone for tuning in tonight. Good night all. I cannot thank our guests enough for coming on the show, for sharing their knowledge and journey. I always pick up learnings from our guests and hopefully you learned something new today. If you want to learn more about Robert Brown, head over to rgbecommerce.com. It's rgbecommerce.com. Links and more information will also be available in the show notes. If anything in this podcast resonated with you and your business, you might want to check other related episodes, including the interview with Robert Giovannini, who shares his insights into the e-commerce nuances for furniture manufacturers. Also, the interview with Jay Schneider, who shares his insights into how B2B digital commerce processes differ from B2C. Also, don't forget to subscribe and spread the word among folks with similar backgrounds. 
If you have any questions or comments about the show, please review and rate us on your favorite podcasting platform or DM me on any social channels. I'll try my best to respond personally and make sure you get help. Thank you and I hope to catch you on the next episode of the WBS Podcast. Thank you for listening to another episode of the WBS Podcast. Be sure to subscribe on your favorite podcasting platform so you never miss an episode. For more information on growth strategies for SMBs using ERP and digital transformation, check out our community at wbs.rocks. We'll see you next time.